Welcome. My name is Rob Keller. Today I would like to talk with you about a story, the regenerative medicine story. So we're going to walk a little bit through the past, talk a little bit about today, development, and then forecast what's happening in the future. So let's start with the past. Regenerative medicine is actually over 200 years old. If we look in 1818, we had the first successful human blood transfusion. This was used to treat postpartum hemorrhage. In women that were bleeding excessively, they would do a blood transfusion to save their life. We're fast forwarding quite a few decades, but in 1954 was our first successful kidney transplant. And then 56, we had our first bone marrow transplant. In the 1960s, we had additional successful transplantations of organs like pancreas, kidney, liver, and even the heart. In the 1970s, the concept of PRP was born. That's platelet-rich plasma. It was used to treat thrombocytopenia, which is low platelet count. And in these patients, we would draw blood, spin it down, and take a middle fraction layer that was rich in growth factors and cytokines. We're going to talk more about those growth factors and cytokines, those chemical messengers, here in a moment. But back to the story. In 1980s, we had transplant of heart, liver, lung, and even cornea. And then in the late 1990s, we had our first tissue-engineered skin. Transite, approved by the FDA, and then its co cousin product, Dermagraft, later was approved. And these were engineered skins that were used to treat burns, full thickness wounds, and scars in patients. Moving forward to present day, over half a million Americans benefit from a transplant each year. Tissue engineered skin, like we talked about, has been used for wound coverings for burns, treatment for diabetic foot ulcers. Uh, and even replacement of skin altogether. Tony Atala's work at Wake Forest with a tissue engineered bladder, that's today. We have Dr. Badalak's work at Purdue and now at the University of Pittsburgh with a small intestinal submucosa that's used to treat burns, chronic pressure ulcers, diabetic skin ulcers, and even deep skin lacerations. Today we've got many preclinical studies, including those that are going through evaluation of tissue engineered vascular grafts for heart bypass surgery and other types of cardiovascular disease. And then what I want to talk the remainder about are stem cells and their precursor cells and the products that they make like growth factors and cytokines that we mentioned earlier. And this is where the field is right now. So let me ask this question. What's a stem cell? Well these are cells that are found in you and I. They're found in various tissue places around the body. Almost all tissues are known to have some type of progenitor cell, otherwise known as a stem cell. Stem cells are multipotent. That means that they can become many different things. And they're kind of like children. So if you put them in an environment, they're influenced by that environment. Like if you put the kid next to the disruptive kid, they become disruptive. You put the kid next to the teacher, they kind of calm down. I might have been that kid, but Back to stem cells. So we're talking about stem cells and how they're influenced by their environment. If you give them cues to become bone tissue, they will differentiate or they will turn into bone. They can turn into muscle. They can turn into nervous tissue. They have a crazy ability to go down different lineages. And so today in regenerative medicine, we're working on how to harness the power of the stem cell and what they produce. Let me show you this video sequence where we've got a stem cell that has begun to divide. And very soon here you'll see one cell become two cells. And as it divides, it's creating products. It's manufacturing from its nucleus using the DNA sequence, what we call messenger RNA. And as it transcribes the messenger RNA, then it translates it into protein. And that protein, it packages it in these little vesicles, these little spheres. And it sends it outside the cell, or in maybe some cases inside the cell. Here in a moment, you'll see some budding vesicles on these cells. They kind of look blubby. And these blobs or blebs are these vesicles that are starting to excrete the proteins that the cell has manufactured. These are chemical signals. They tell nearby cells what to do. They can tell nearby cells to heal, to differentiate, to proliferate, to grow, divide, repair. So let me ask this question. 
how can we actually stimulate the stem cells that are in our tissues to awaken or to do what they know how to do and stimulate repair? Well, the answer is we can actually deliver growth factors and cytokines, these chemical signals that they make, to the damaged tissue. And that's really what this field is about today. So where are some sources of stem cells that we can go to? Well, a non-controversial source comes from amniotic tissue, birth tissue. So the amnion is made up of two layers. It's got the amniotic layer and it's got the chorionic layer. And this is part of the placenta or the afterbirth. And usually after the baby is born, the placenta is discarded. So what we can do in the field is we can take this tissue, we can harvest a very youthful source of stem cells as well as growth factors and cytokines, and we can use them for regenerative medicine. And that's exactly what's happening today. So this tissue is harvested, we isolate the cells from the amnion, we actually grow those cells like you saw in the video in the laboratory, in a clean room laboratory, because we're manufacturing essentially. And then we harvest or we pull off the media only or the environmental fluid that the cells have conditioned. And they're rich with growth factors and they're rich with cytokines, these chemical signals that tell nearby cells what to do. And that's essentially how we can stimulate nearby cells in our tissues that have damage to wake up and go do what they're programmed to do. The body has a tremendous ability to heal and heal itself. And so by delivering signals to do so, we can actually kickstart our own healing process. So this company, Axolotl Biologics, I'm affiliated with, and they have a product called Axolotl Ambient. And it uses this exact process that I've described. So the cells that are shown up here in the blue sphere have a nucleus, the darker blue. That's where the DNA resides. It is then transcribed into a messenger RNA that translates into protein and you can see these spheres that have contents. The contents are the growth factors and cytokines. If you move to the edge of the blue cell you can see how they sort of dump the contents or exocytose or excrete these chemical signals into their outside environment. That's what was happening in that video. And then a nearby cell that would be in your tissue that's damaged sees those signals and responds. So this ambient fluid is collected and it has a shelf life of 18 months and it is terminally irradiated so it's safe to use and it uses a very proprietary process in order to do all this to render the product itself acellular so there's no living cells in it. Just those growth factors and cytokines. What's in it? Well, this is a very busy slide. But let me digest it for you. On the right side is a graph, and this graph is taken from the literature that shows us the different phases of normal wound healing. And you can see there's some labels up top. Like we've got a hemostatic phase, we have an inflammatory phase, we have a proliferatory phase, and we have a remodeling phase. And no matter if it's bone, skin, muscle, if it's damaged, it's going to go through this same process. And there are chemical mediators that are responsible for each one of these phases. And that's the alphabet soup that you see on the left. So all of these letters and nomenclature on the left are pulling from the scientific literature known growth factors and cytokines and what they do. The ones that are responsible for an inflammatory phase, the ones that are responsible for a proliferatory phase or a migratory phase or a remodeling phase. And these types of regenerative fluids have these growth factors and cytokines within them and that's how they work. Let me show you what they can do. So in this patient, this was a fibular fracture, so this is the bone on the lower part of the leg just above the ankle but it's on the outside of the leg. It's the smaller of the two bones of the lower leg. If you zoom in on the left side you can see this blue arrow is pointing to a fibular fracture. That's sort of that black line that you can see there uh, that shouldn't be there. And by treating with a regenerative fluid, in four weeks we've got complete healing that you can see on the right side. That fracture is gone. This patient was ambulatory. They were weight bearing. They were wearing a boot. It wasn't casted. They were treated with a regenerative fluid. And we cut the healing time in half, essentially. This next slide sequence uh, is a wound. So it, it might be a little bit uh, 
difficult for some people to watch. So just giving you a fair warning. This was a wound that had been opened in this patient uh, for five years. This wound is on the back of the lower leg, just above the ankle, okay? A very irritable location. And this was a diabetic patient, and that's the reason it stayed open. They have poor distal perfusion, meaning they don't get blood flow to the lower legs very well. It has a low level of oxygen in the tissues, and they're prone to these types of ulcerated wounds. So they threw everything at this wound that they possibly could think of, and they couldn't get it to close in this patient. Five years of treatment. We treated this with the regenerative fluid, and you can see the sequence in just over two weeks we've got complete epithelialization, or we've got wound closure. Now, it's not fully healed, but they had never seen these types of results in all the different treatments that they've tried in five years of treating this patient, and so they affectionately named this patient the Million Dollar Wound because of all the resources that they had spent trying to get it to close. So, what's happening tomorrow? This is where we are today. Where are we actually headed? Well. This is a time sequence. There's a lot of information on this slide, so let me just highlight a couple of key points in time. So in 1953, Watson and Crick got credit for the architecture of DNA. Now, they actually took credit. It was their postdoc, Rosalind Franklin, that actually did it. But uh, anyways, uh, they're the ones that reported in 1953 the success, which was a monumental success, and they were intimately involved. There's no question about that. And then we wind forward into 2001, where the human genome was sequenced. A huge Herculean effort. It was a combination between actually the federal government or academia and industry. There was a race to actually sequence the human genome during the Clinton era. And we were successful. And with that success, it has kind of opened the skies. The stars in the skies are the limit. We now have the sequences of DNA to actually recombinantly make things like insulin for diabetic patients. We can make erythropoietin for patients that have low hematocrit. They have trouble carrying oxygen. Uh, cancer patients fall into this category. And we can make human proteins. And one particular human protein I want to characterize for you uh, that I've been associated with with my scientific colleague, Dr. Ensley, is tropoelastin. So this is a really interesting, unique protein that we manufacture uh, in the laboratory and we make it because we have the sequence based upon the work from the human genome. And so proteins are kind of like super glue. They're manufactured in a liquid form. And then when they are ready to be spit out of the cell or excreted out of the cell, they lose their leader sequence. It's cleaved off. And then they spontaneously polymerize and start forming these fabric sheets. Much like when super glue comes out of the bottle and hits the air, it turns into a solid. This is the three-dimensional architecture of tropoelastin. Now, let me tell you all the different things that we can do with it. We can make tissues. We can make patches. We can make replacement blood vessels or tubes. We can even make skin. Skin is a complex organ, but we can actually fabricate a tissue-engineered skin. And this skin, in this image, is the gray background. And the blue cells that are on top are fibroblasts, human dermal fibroblasts, or skin cells. And they're growing on top of this skin, letting you know that they're very happy with the environment that they're found in. This is what we're doing today with regenerative medicine. And this is where I think the future can go. So what all can we do in the future? I'm not sure. But this is from Howard Hughes Medical Institute. This is a video of the axolotl. This is the video of a salamander or a newt. It's been described in the regenerative medicine literature as a novelty because of its amazing ability to regenerate. It can repair its spinal cord upon injury. It can repair limbs, parts of its heart. Almost the entire organ of the heart can be regenerated. And in these axolotls, if they have a traumatic event where they lose a limb, there are stem cells in that limb bud that are programmed at the level of the DNA they know exactly what to do. The wound closes, and the stem cells go to work. And what are they doing? These stem cells are getting the appropriate chemical signals, those growth factors and cytokines that are in that limb bud, to trigger a regenerative event. And they go to work. They regenerate the new limb. Now, as they regenerate that new limb, so many different mechanistic processes are happening. 
but it results in not just a scar. It results in completely new bone forming, new muscles, and even new digits. The power of our bodies, our organisms, are incredible. And if you were to ask me what's going to be happening in the future, I don't know the answer to that, but I think we'll be limited only by our own imagination. Thank you. Hello, welcome. My name is Rob Keller. Today, I would like to talk with you about a story, a story of mine, talking a little bit about entrepreneurship and startup companies. And the title of today's talk or this lecture is Looking at Alternative Markets for Your Technology. And I, I chose this title uh, because this next title seemed a little ominous. And let me explain. While, while it sounds like of biblical proportions, in startup world with entrepreneurship, we've got this marked valley of death that's well described. So this is from the National Science Foundation, NSF, talking about innovation programs. And what you can see from this slide on the far left is there are a variety of different funding opportunities to get your idea off the bench top or into a prototype and early development, ultimately with the goal of commercializing. But you can see the commercialization pathway on the far right of this slide is on the other side of this valley of death. And what you can see on the left side with funding mechanisms such as the last one listed, the SBIR, the STTR pathway. I'm going to talk a little bit more about my experience there and an example later in the lecture. But those public funding opportunities that are available are wonderful to use, but they peter out. And in order to go after commercialization and private funds, one needs to be really thinking about where those funds are going to come from. If we look in the literature, we can see there are a variety of different reasons why startups fail. And I just want to highlight the top five on this list because they're the most significant and the ones that I felt have definitely played a huge role in my experiences. And you can see many of these can be addressed. Things like a business plan or understanding your market. Actually, four out of the five on this list, uh, making good hires, can, can be addressed relatively easily. But the money topic is one that's really tough to tackle if you don't have a plan. And so in my opinion, uh, in my experience, this surviving the valley of death, kind of the number one reason that um, we don't or companies don't is due to capital, due to the inability to find those funds to move from that left side of the graph to the right side of the graph, move from early prototype development, taking your idea and putting it into the commercial market on the right side of that graph. And many of us have this dream we're on a bicycle, and the finish line is just a nice, easy uphill grade. Not too steep, nice and smooth. And in reality, you can see that there's all these different pitfalls. There's many different speed bumps, many different hurdles that we have to overcome. And we see that 90% of new ventures, if they don't attract invent, uh, investors in, within the first three years, then they fail. And this is a, a huge challenge or a complication for us in the startup world. And so the question that I'm posing is, you know, where can you creatively think about funding your endeavor? And there's a number of well-described lists. Number one, you can self-fund. You can save. What an idea, right? You can save your own money and then start your company. You can go to friends and family. Now we have crowdfunding available to us. We can look at business grants, both local and national opportunities. Those national opportunities like the NSF, STTR, or SBIR pathways. Those are small business grants, non-dilutive money. They don't take any portion of your company. You don't have a debt that has to be paid back. It's truly a grant. Uh, or we have loans, like in the form of an SBA loan or a line of credit. The one area that I wanted to talk to you about, and the reason for the title of this talk, is there are opportunities maybe to get early revenue. Think outside the box. Look to places where you weren't paying attention that your technology or your idea could move into a commercial sector, create an opportunity to help a population that maybe wasn't your original target. And I'm going to give you some examples. So I'm a scientist. And my scientific colleague, Dr. Ensley, and I have been working on a new biomaterial for many, many years. 
And this patent was issued in 2015, and it was a long prosecution to get it issued. Uh, but we were thinking that this technology would be revolutionary. And so this protein, known as tropolastin, is really cool. So let me tell you a little bit about it. It's a biomaterial. You and I make it. Our bodies make it until about the age of 12 or 13, and then the gene turns off. It goes silent, and we no longer manufacture it. But kind of like superglue, proteins in our bodies are made as a liquid precursor. That's the tropoelastin. The tropo part means that it's the precursor to the elastin protein. So if you grab the back of your skin and you pull on it, it snaps back because of elastin, like a rubber band. Well, you stop making that elastin in your preteen years, and then we're stuck with the elastin in our organs for the rest of our life. And it slowly deteriorates, a half-life of about 70 years. So at the age of 70, there's about half the elastin in our skin than when we were born. And we can see that. We can tell. And that's why it's not as elastomeric. Well, that happens to heart, skin, liver, blood vessels, bladder, and the list goes on. Bones have a component of elastin. That's why they're not brittle. Well, when the cell makes this elastin protein, there's a leader sequence. And you can see the top portion of this gets cleaved off when the cell releases it outside. And when that release uh, protein goes out without its leader sequence, it starts to spontaneously cross-link, like super glue when it comes out of the bottle and hits the air. It polymerizes, and it turns into a fabric or a sheet. And that's the making of tissue. So we've been able to replicate this in the laboratory, and we can literally make human tropoelastin using recombinant techniques. This is a three-dimensional picture uh, rendition of what tropoelastin looks like. And where can it be used? Well, we can actually fabricate synthetic tissue. We can make it from human proteins. We can make sheets. We can actually make tubes, like an artificial blood vessel. We can even make skin, a multi-layered, complex organ. And so this skin I want to talk to you about in this next slide, this is what it looks like. This is a scanning electron micrograph in the background, the kind of gray scale. That's the sheet of skin that we made using tropoelastin. And the blue spheres that are laying on top are human skin cells. And so these skin cells love the skin because they think that it's the native architecture that they're supposed to live in. So really cool idea that Dr. Ensley and I have been working on together as a, as a partnership. And we were thinking about how are we going to commercialize this technology? How are we going to bridge that valley of death? Um, and the way to do that is going to be about 10 to 12 years of development. It's probably going to cost somewhere between 10 and $50 million. Well, if we're self-funding, I didn't have that kind of money laying around. And so we started thinking, where are the alternative markets? Well, we're making skin, but we're making a liquid precursor. And so we started focusing on an alternative market after some investigations. And there's a $4.5 billion skincare market here in the US alone. So that's where we pivoted to. And this early revenue stream, we went after print advertising, taking out specific ads and magazines you've probably heard of. And it evolved to print advertising, where they would place orders and buy our products in a consumer industry generating early revenue. And then, of course, the internet age pivoted. And now we sell online on this website, e-commerce. We've partnered with other distributors. And we've expanded our product line to include lash, brow, as well as hair. And in this way, we're bridging this valley of death. We're generating funds early in the company's life cycle to be able to make the bigger investments in the future. So we've partnered with this company, Axolotl Biologic, on our main goal that's a little further out. And that main goal that's a little further out is in the device world and how we're going to build replacement skin to help close diabetic wounds. So here's a publication, a recent publication of ours, summarizing our research. This was funded using an STTR grant from NIH rather than NSF. But using some of those early public funds that are available <clears throat> and investing in our technology and developing data sets that are going to allow for future commercialization. And what we're seeing early on is extremely encouraging. And these results that are paid for by this grant and future studies that are paid for by the reinvestment of revenue 
from our early revenue opportunities in the cosmetic space. We're seeing the green graph il illustrating wound closure is happening at an accelerated rate compared to what happens using a commercially available technology that's available today. And so we're seeing that we can accelerate the healing using our replacement skin that contains this tropoelastin. And again, all of this is, cap is possible because of NIH money, as well as early revenue opportunities by pursuing these alternative markets. So I want to leave you with this. Think big. Think outside the box. Don't lose sight of your goal. And I know as inventors, scientists, engineers, entrepreneurs, we tend to be very narrow focused. We have to be to be successful. But sometimes we have to take those blinders off, listen to other voices that may provide us with opportunities that we weren't paying attention to. And considering these alternative markets may allow for us to fund our goals for the long term and allow us to bridge that valley of death. Thank you.